Hello and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And on today's show, we're going to take a deep dive. Uh, and I've learned a lot of interesting things about the Texas Triangle. Uh, we're going to learn about the Texas Triangle and um, why that might be a great area to invest in. And uh, please welcome Ryan Nunes. Ryan's worked in uh, worked on Wall Street for 13 years as one of the youngest managing directors at his firm. He led the derivative sales team and generated over 200 million in gross margin by providing commodity price risk management solutions to senior oil and gas executives. Uh, Ryan is the president and founder of Life Changing Capital, a Houston, Texas commercial real estate private equity firm, and is a general partner in 777 units and a limited partner in 3,102 units. Uh, Ryan and his team take an institutional, transparent, and hands-on approach to multifamily with a focus on the Texas Triangle. Awesome. Welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to kind of dive in, and, and, and I went to your website. I was Before we went online, I was telling you I really liked your website because you, you pointed to some really important facts of of, of where you're investing and, you know, your box of where you're buying and that um, you really, to, to buy deals, you have to look at a lot of deals. And I, and I heard you say on a podcast or in one of your videos about looking at 400 deals to buy, to buy three, three deals. So that's a lot of, a lot of sifting you do as a, as a multifamily investor. And, um, and the other thing I thought was really interesting is I didn't really realize the Texas Triangle and the Texas Triangle uh, is Dallas, San Antonio and what's Houston. Uh, and Houston is comprises the Texas Triangle and uh, some interesting facts that I think the viewers are going to appreciate. And I found this on your website, which is useful. The GDP of Texas is roughly the size of uh, Canada's GDP. Uh, seven of the 10 largest universities are uh, in Texas are in these four cities. 53 of 54 Fortune 500 companies are in the Texas Triangle. The Texas Triangle is expected to add 3.5 million people by 2030, which is a 19.3% increase. More Americans are moving to Texas than any other state for the 13th year in a row. That's 1,095 people move there every single day. So that's fascinating. and and. You are in uh, Texas right there too for the past nine or so years. That's right. So I've been, I moved to, to Houston. Gosh, it's, it's going to be coming up on 12 years. So, um, so you're a Wall Street guy. So you're obviously very educated. You have your master's. Um, at, at what point did you say, did you want to leave Wall Street and then get into the multifamily business? How did that transpire? Yeah, I'd been thinking about it for a number of years. Uh, I was in the commodity space and there was a lot of boom and bust within that. And it seemed like at the banks, it was all about doing more with less. Uh, and commodities was more a question of, you know, how sustainable is this going to be as the world transitions to renewable energy and, and, and EV vehicles. And so decided that uh, for a number of years was my New Year's resolution to figure out what else could I do? What else would be transferable for my skills? And, you know, I felt like I was in the halftime of my career and said, you know, I want to do something new, different, um, that I could apprentice my children and could start really um, laying a strong foundation for them. And I think as parents, uh, we all hope our kids go to good schools, but in my way, this was a, a hedge against that to say, if we could learn about real estate and um, learn how to operate and own properties that, you know, they would have something that they could fall back on. And so that was a huge motivating factor for me. And then when I learned about the, the depreciation um, and the tax benefits of multifamily, basically for every dollar that you invest, and you get 70 to 80 cents back on each dollar uh, if you're a real estate professional that you can apply towards income um, on your W-2 and, and other income sources. So that was super, super attractive uh, to me. I got a number of six figure type um, refunds from the IRS uh, through real estate investing. And um, 
it's been great. I mean, I've, I've learned a ton. It's been a strong transition and uh, I've really enjoyed multifamily. Um, you know, Bo, you had mentioned 400 deals that we've looked at. It is kissing a lot of frogs, uh, but we are uber selective about the things that we chase and pursue, uh, mostly because, you know, we're investing, uh, investors are entrusting us with that element of selectivity, but also, you know, we're investing their capital on ours. And so that just comes with uh, uh, a high degree of responsibility. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're, so when you first got started, did you invest because you you're invested in over 3000 doors as an LP or limited partner. So was it, was that your model to kind of go in passively in the beginning, see what other other uh, operators are doing and then start start um, driving your own kind of uh, business model into the multifamily space? A great question. I was kind of dual tracking. Uh, one, I wanted to passively invest just to you know see how that all worked. Um, and then I knew I needed to invest a certain amount of capital to get the targeted um, refund or rebate from the IRS that I was looking for. But to do that effectively, I needed to become a uh, general partner and being actively involved in real estate. And so while I was pursuing the active involvement in real estate, I wanted to passively invest for two reasons, diversification, I'm a big fan of diversification um, throughout my career. And then two, to learn how other sponsors did things, you know, better, different. Um, so that, that was kind of the motivation. So yeah, I've invested passively in over 20 deals and five of which have been deals that I'm a general partner in. Oh, very nice. And so, so the Texas Triangle is really where you're focused. You live close. Um, it's probably also challenging because there's you're you're not the only investor in that market looking for deals. Um, but are you continuing to kind of stay focused in the in the uh, Texas Triangle? Yes, we are. Uh, there, I feel like there's a there's there's so much uh, to look at just in in San Antonio, Dallas, and in Houston, and it's tempting to. Uh, you know, someone was just at my house and they were saying, well, you know, the, I think it's Blue Origin, uh, Amazon has some area and, you know, why don't we look there? And it's, it's just, it becomes a shiny object syndrome. So we try to stay disciplined, stay focused, you know, stick to areas we know well um, and where we feel we have some core confidence. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. I appreciate you checking out our channel. On this podcast, we talk about real estate, investing, financing, business lending, and acquiring and expanding your business. I'm sure you will find some videos here that will help you build your business empire. There's a lot to see. Take your time and make sure you comment, like, and subscribe. Thanks again. So when you made the transition and now you're starting to raise capital for these syndications, um, you were once this Wall Street guy. Did that make it easier to raise money? Obviously, you you talk money as a business. That's your analytical. Um, you kind of fit the kind of mold of somebody that can raise money and and in a, you know pro, show pro formas and and show why the deal is a good deal. Um, did you get it? Did you get any pushback from any of your Wall Street colleagues, or were they eager to invest in deals because they you, you started explaining the tax benefits and things to them, and they're like, "Wow, this makes sense." You know, I, I was very humbled to be honest. I remember you know raising for my first deal, and you know my expectations were like, "Hey, I know how much money I'm putting into the deal, and if anybody wants to join me, that's great." Um, you know, and I just kind of very I like to always be transparent, so I was like, "You know, this is." a new thing for me. So, you know, if you want to come along for uh, and invest with me, here's how much capital I'm putting in because I, I like what I see. And yeah, it is also because of tax benefits. But there were so many people that were like, you know, we like you, we trust you from your professional career. And, you know, if you spent this amount of time and, and you're putting this much capital in, you know, it, it makes, it, it seems like it's a good deal and it makes sense. And that deal has performed solidly well. We've been distributing 10% monthly on that deal. And we just did a supplemental loan where we returned 62% of our investors' capital. So, you know, the folks that joined me on that also joined me on a number of other investments and, um, you know, they've been repeat and, and um, uh, investors, which has been great. So when you're modeling these, um, are you really looking at like a, a seven to 10 year hold? not a quick flip and, and then then refinance and, and try to 
boost returns by doing these supplemental loans? Is that kind of the strategy? We underwrite to a five-year hold and we typically don't underwrite a refinancing um, you know, just because that could, that, there's risk in a refinancing that, you know, all the stars align that you hit your NOI and then hit, you know, the interest rate that you're forecasting and so forth. But we just typically underwrite to a five-year hold and, um, you know, we try to just make sure that investors are aware that, that this isn't a liquid asset. It's not Amazon stock. You can be in and out of it you know, the next day. Um, but I would say, fortunately, the way that we've bought our deals, you know, I, I think probably they're going to be closer to a, a one to two year hold than they are a five year hold. Um, just given, you know, the, the craziness we're seeing in the market. And, you know, we bought a deal a few months back and two months later, a deal traded, you know, 30 percent higher. Than what we paid for it, you know, a few months earlier. So, um, but you know, we don't want investors to think like that's always going to be the case. So we just say five year hold. You know, make sure it's money that you know you can invest and you don't need right away, um, and it's diversified money that you know you have other investments that are more liquid that you can access if if you need to. And I, I think that's kind of important too because like the, we're in this kind of uncharted territories where a lot of people have made huge gains in real estate. Um, and, and it's probably not likely that we're going to see this growth continued like, like it has been. So, um, it, it's kind of, it's a great thing for your investors, but then sometimes they think that this is always going to be the way it is and, and not necessarily. So you, you have to underwrite these conservatively, I guess, and kind of like let people know, like, this is a really good deal. We, we, we were able to move rents up by $500 premium. That's not typical, but the market is bearing it right now. Um, and so you, it's probably setting a lot of expectations is just let, let people know to be, let's do a, let's look at this conservatively. And this is where we think it's going to lie. And if we do better, we do better. I think that's important because people are, are used to winning right now. It seems like in, in the real estate space. And now, like, I, I guess kind of a question I have is since you have the wall street background, there's like, I just read an article, 2021 uh, Q4, it said one out of every five single family homes w was purchased by like a hedge fund or, you know, one of these big, and I, I didn't realize it was that major. Um, so do you consider, do you think that that trend, like, cause I, I've been to the point, like, especially in the single family space, I guess I'm kind of circling on this question that, um, you know, are we at a at a price point and rent price point that we're going to start bought, flattening out? And now that I, I'm reading these articles about these hedge funds, it's kind of surprising. There are a lot of smart people and they're they're bullish on real estate too. So like from a Wall Street perspective, do you think do you think that bull runs going to continue for the next 12, 24 months or do you think it's going to start tampering off? Well, you know, I think a, a few things. You know, great, great points. Um, a few things. I've I've seen hedge funds do extremely well, um, and I've seen the hedge funds blow up many, many times. Um, and so, you know, I was in the commodities markets when a super smart hedge fund lost six billion dollars. So, um, you know, just because a hedge fund is doing something, it doesn't make me feel like, hey, you know, the market's going to continue to go one way. Um, you know, I, I, if you kind of mapped out all the risks. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of risks in the market right now and that, you know, people have just, you know, going into multifamily uh, like crazy. But, you know, if, if rates go up, you know, I think people, it's relative value, right? People say, you know, I can take all this operational risk on a BNC asset or, you know, I can invest in something else. So, you know, valuations at the end of the day need to make sense. And I would say relative to other asset classes, uh, rents can't keep going up at, you know, a uh, 10 to 20% annualized clip um, because the renters just can't afford it, right? So at the end of the day, there has to be some affordability. If you remove rent restrictions, what's the health of the asset? Or sorry, not rent restrictions, rent uh, rent assistance. Uh, what is the health of the asset? So, um, you know, there's, there's an element of just making sure that when you're buying, you're thinking through those things. Um, and, you know, just there, there is a lot of risk in the market. Um, yeah, there is a lot of inflation as well, but you know, I think that the Fed can't let that keep going on. Something is going to have to break. Um, so, you know, I just 
I think it's, it's, you know, we are selling some deals right now in this market, um, you know, and uh, I think that, you know, you just have to be careful and buy right. Yeah, that's, that's true. I agree with you. Um, now your, your business model is, is you're not, are you vertically integrated or where you, you do property management in-house or do you outsource that to the top property management company in that, that market? That's right. We, uh, we are not vertically integrated. Um, you know, hopefully one day we will be when, when we get to a scale and scope of that size, but we, we do use third party management. And what's usually your process on, on figuring out which property manager you feel most comfortable with on, on a deal? A lot of it is a philosophical approach. Um, you know, a big thing for us is, is having just direct inter in, interaction with the, the staff on site, because at the end of the day, those are the people that are, that are touching each resident each day, right? They're the ones that are going to be interacting with prospects. And so it's really important that um, we build that rapport and that we understand and we're involved in who is the person in that seat, because, you know, as much as we think we're going to be directing the business plan and we are, um, you know, it, it, it really hinges upon that property management person and the maintenance person, you know, on site to just deliver the quality of service and care that we want. Um, our business plan is very much, we're very aggressive in terms of rents, but we also deliver a very premium product. So, and we'll go into a submarket and all our assets, we're leading the immediate submarket in rents, but we're able to do that if and only if the staff delivers that premium level of service. Um, so taking care of maintenance requests, uh, making sure the units look and feel good and are, are, you know, delivering what people are paying for. So there's a good value offering. Are you doing anything like uh, any sizzle features that you find really like putting dog parks in or, or do you, or do you just have your CapEx plan? And, and um, what we were talking before we went on, you said, or I was reading earlier on, you were just, you, you bought your, you know, you screened 400 deals, you bought three um, and you were looking for 90% occupancy ease of financing and probably, and, and, and you knew day one, you're going to cash flow now is, you've built out your systems, you would take on a bigger, a, a bigger uh, value add type of deal. Um, and probably with this market, it's there, that would probably be the way to get the returns your investors would want. Um, but as far as like, when you, when you go into a property, what do you, uh, what do you obviously put in the systems in place operational to, to streamline efficiencies with uh, expenses and so forth, but is there anything that you, you, your team does, do you add dog parks or any kind of cable systems or internet systems that like people love and you can then get premiums for? Sure. So, uh, you know, typically we're looking for deals where there's value add. And I think we're even more open to um, but when we were talking about stabilized, even non-stabilized deals, if we can point to, you know, a pathway to stabilize it and to make it performing. Um, <clears throat> so we bid on assets like that and we're comfortable with that, particularly as we've just gotten more operational experience and we've seen, as mentioned to you before, we recently renovated a unit. So that unit was classic or so before. So original cabinets. We went in, put in stainless appliances, put in cords, undermount sinks, nice faucets, change the paint colors, um, change the lighting, and we got a $577 rent increase. So almost a 50% increase in rents, which is huge. And you know, with that, it gives us confidence to, to you know, that was you know, way above our pro forma projections. And so it gives us that confidence that we can go in, we can take on a heavier value add project if we're seeing that type of rent growth um, and being able to push that rents um, after, after you know, repositioning a unit, if you will. Um, so we're more confident and comfortable with a, with a heavier value add, which is, it just needs to make sense. Um, it needs to make sense that, okay, you know, there's other competing properties that are renting for these rents or selling for these amounts uh, post repositioning. So, but typically when we're buying something, you know, we look for good demographics and that there's true value add to be had there, whether that's operational, whether that's, you know, adding amenities, um, whether that's, you know, you know upgrading the, the resident base and, and really attacking the interior of the units to make them a better place to live. When you got into multifamily, um, are you a, a personality type where you just kind of teach yourself or did you have a specific, 
kind of mentor you follow the, the, you know took a lot of advice from and 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 gained knowledge in this space or are you kind of a self-taught person you know it's a, it's been a mix of both i mean there's there's a lot of people out there that uh that mentor and so forth um but it, to me it was i learned the most by just doing so talking with other people that were active in the space looking at all the deals that we looked at to really figure out what are the things that we like in the deal and where do we see those deals perform and 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 then on the asset management side i think we probably learned the most just managing our own deals um and then saying, you know, what are the KPIs that we need to look at? What are the things that we need to focus on in our weekly calls? And what things work well? What resonates with the residents? What doesn't? So it's really been learning by doing. Um, and, you know, I think that's that's really the only way to learn the space. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Good advice. And you have there's there you have yourself and there's one other um, head partner. Uh, and he was he was also a Wall Street um, professional that transitioned. Did you guys from day one start together and just start building off each other or did did you start first and you brought him on or how did that all work yeah he started he started about a year or so before me and then um i co-sponsored with two other partners and you know through that process just realized um i wanted to work with someone that had you know a similar background that had worked on wall street just speaking the same parlance and being able to um you know trust each other's judgment and you know, level of analytical rigor. And it's been a great partnership. I think obviously, you know, in hindsight, we wish we bought more deals. Um, yeah, we have looked at probably closer to 500 now. Um, you know, we're constantly bidding on deals. It's, um, but we also realize that for these deals to perform, it, it takes a lot of a lot of work. And I think asset management is really, um, we want to deliver on what we've, what we've promised to investors. So we spend a ton of time on that. And do you, do you both share the same amount of responsibilities or does one partner do certain things and the other partner, or is it kind of just, you both just do tasks together kind of thing? Yeah. So we're both on the, all, all our weekly calls and, you know, he takes more of the lead on the underwriting on the relationships with the banks and the insurance companies and taxes. And then I take more of the lead on operations, the marketing, um, just making sure our interior upgrades are being implemented to uh, a certain level. And we can switch on either of those, but it's just, that's kind of how it's set up now where we've gravitated towards, um, you know, multifamily, it's, it's, there's so much work to be done. Um, so we try and say like, you know, you take the lead for this, I'll take the lead for that. Um, and then just constantly bouncing, you know, ideas off each other of, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Should we push rents here? Should we do this? Um, just to make sure we have each other's buy-in. And, you know, I'm really happy to say that, you know, we've been through a lot, um, the ups and downs of multifamily and, you know, it's, it's always been a very positive experience, um, you know, going through the trials and tribulations of, you know, owning deals and managing deals, but, you know, we've stuck it out together, which has been great. And um, what's one thing you would tell yourself uh, if you could go back and tell yourself when you first got into the uh, multifamily space and other than buy more properties, what would you have told yourself? I would definitely tell myself to do that. Um, you know, but the world is, it's, it's like when we were buying our deals, we bought two during, you know, the, the depths of COVID and, you know, the world was so uncertain. There was no rent relief at that time. So, um, it, you know, and, and it was, when you look at the blessing and curse of how deals are valued is cap rate. So a five cap, or let's just say the market's more closer to a four cap now. So one dollar of NOI is really is really uh, twenty five dollars of value. So if things move down ten percent, I mean that's a huge degradation in valuation. And so you know we were definitely concerned about where values would shake out through COVID. We kept bidding on assets. Unfortunately, we were able to win what we won. Um, but I would say just having more confidence. You know, there was definitely an element of you know, growing in confidence step by step, but sometimes you need to take more jumps um, and, and even take more risks. Um, you know, that's easy to say the market went one way. If it had gone the other way, maybe I'd be saying, you know, I'm glad we, 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 we went slowly. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done and, you know, that we've had investors that have uh, been very generous with investing with us. I mean, we, our last deal, we raised $4.2 million in a few hours. 
um, a lot of repeat investors as well, which which speaks volumes. Um, so you know, I just again, I just wish we we were able to have bought more. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a common thread. Well, Ryan, it's been a pleasure uh, having you on the show. Uh, where can people follow you or learn more about your your investment criteria, and and if they're interested in you know potentially looking at some of your deal offerings, and or just want to learn more about you? Do you have a podcast? I know your website is it's lifechangingcapital.com. Is there any other places you would want people to follow you? Yeah, that's that's a great. I mean, that lifechangingcapital.com is uh, there's a number of resources for for folks on your podcast. There's 25 questions every passive investor should ask, which you know from having invested in 20 deals, and uh, there's a kind of real life stories about um, you know when investing and things to look out for. So for people interested in the space, I would say that's a great resource. That's on our website. We host a meetup in Houston, so if you're local, um, we'd love to have you come out to that. Um, but lifechangingcapital.com, you can book a time to chat if, uh, if anything I said resonates. Perfect. Well, thank you. You, you pro provided a lot of value today. I enjoyed our conversation. And everybody, please like and subscribe to this video if you're watching on YouTube. Or if you're listening, please uh, put a review on uh, any of the platforms you're listening on. Thank you so much, Ryan. And we'll uh, see everybody else in the next show. Thanks, Bo. Really appreciate it.